What do you consider the farthest, most exotic, and most mysterious place on Earth? When I was a student in New England, Borobudur in Java loomed largest and most mesmerizing for me. Borobudur, the huge ancient Buddhist stupa in central Java, exerted fascination like few other monuments on Earth. I knew that it was the largest Buddhist monument in the world and one of the most complex and exquisitely sculptural. And I actually found myself facing the sacred stone mountain only a few months after I graduated from college and began my stint as a loose scholar in Asia. Let's fly low above the plains of central Java. We're not far from the city of Yogyakarta. There's a beautiful, lush, green valley. You can see that we're surrounded by low mountain ranges. There are several active volcanoes here, including Mount Merapi, which erupted in 2010. Two rivers converge here. The land is fertile, rich, and green. Palms dot the terrain between terraces of flourishing rice. This is the Kedu Plain, known as the Paradise of Java. And it is magical and secluded. It feels as if it is entirely apart from anything modern or unharmonious with nature. In the distance, there's a gentle domed mountain that seems to rise out of the low-lying lands, but it's not entirely a natural feature of the plain. It's a man-made stone mountain created with complex terraces, both square and circular, and topped by a high stone dome. What you see is the famous stupa of Borobudur. It might even have once been at the center of a shallow lake, mirroring the Buddhist conception of the universe as a lotus floating on an ocean. The Buddha was born in what is today Nepal. However, his philosophy and teaching spread all over India and far beyond. When sailors and traders from India reached the Spice Islands, Sumatra, Java, and the archipelago to the east, they also brought the influence of India and the teachings of the Buddha. The people of the nation that we now call Indonesia took to new religions very readily. They were famously good at syncretizing faiths, layering one upon the other. They layered ancestor cults, Buddhism, Hinduism, and later Islam on a base of animism to create a unique mix of culture and faith. We're not sure exactly when Buddhism reached the shores of Java. It was probably in the first centuries AD, but it was during the Sailendra dynasty that Buddhism inspired the creation of Borobudur, which was built during the 8th to 9th centuries AD under King Samaratanga. Javanese Buddhism had gravitated to the Mahayana form, which had a rich pantheon of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, reflecting a previous richness of the Indonesian religious manifestations. And this rich and diverse pantheon found expression in art and architecture most grandly at Borbudur, where the carvings in relief give the lengthiest visual account of the Buddha's life and his teachings. It took an enormous expenditure of labor and planning to create this monument. Some say it took as many as 75 years to finish the stupa. It wasn't just religion that traveled to Indonesia from India. The art, crafts, styles, and architecture from India had a profound influence too, and there was trade in both directions. Indonesia has a culture that is rich in art and imagination, and it has an admirable focus on creativity. So many new ideas, styles, crafts, and technologies reached these islands, which dotted the seas in an arc from the Malay Peninsula all the way to New Guinea. Many art forms were adopted, but they were given their own stamp so that they were undeniably Javanese or Balinese or belonged to another of the island's cultures. And these artistic creations were ed everywhere, incredibly elegant, colorful, and based on the most pleasing forms in nature. Here's an example of batik cloth, 
which I collected in Java. It has delicate drawings that were made in wax on the cloth, which was then dyed. Batik dyeing of textiles, ikat dyeing and weaving, shadow puppets, elaborate silverwork, wood sculpture, all had their own characteristic original forms in the culture of Indonesia. Art is everywhere in the islands, and it serves both to provide spiritual uplift and the cohesive purposes of society well. For instance, when I stayed with my museum colleagues from Jakarta on Bali, every morning a flower and folded bamboo offering appeared at our door and at every other door. Such offerings were de rigueur and showed the gratitude of people to their gods, not in prayer, but in art. We saw how at Sanchi in India, the stupa represented the Buddha and his teachings, and it provided the kind of experience for a Buddhist pilgrim that would encourage devotion and adherence to the Buddhist path. Pilgrims who visited were venerating the Buddha, yes, but they were also creating a transcendent experience for themselves. They were learning the teachings of the Buddha from a wealth of visual and sensory stimuli. The form of the stupa, being at heart a mountain associated with deities and the cosmos, has universal appeal. And so we find the specific Buddhist form, the stupa, made its way to central Java to appear there in a unique iteration. Borobudur is both a stupa and a cosmic mountain, Mount Meru, the sacred world mountain, with a spiritual quest embodied within it. The origin of the name of the monument, Borobudur, is not agreed upon, but it has been read as the second part of the mountain of the accumulation of virtue in the ten stages of the Bodhisattva. This name appears to refer to the architecture of Borobudur as a mountain of ten terraces. Borobudur, then, is a mystical diagram of the cosmos. The sides are oriented to the cardinal directions. The topmost stupa signifies the axis mundi, or the center or navel of the earth. When you climb the terraces, you reenact a journey of the soul from the earthly world of desires to the realm of spiritual perfection, that of the Buddha. Let's look more closely at the parts of Borobudur and see what they signify. First, the overall shape. What we have here is essentially a low, complex, stepped pyramid and not the smooth round dome that we saw at Sanchi. Borobudur, though it's Buddhist, has more in common in terms of accessibility with the ziggurat at Ur than with the Buddhist stupa at Sanchi. You can climb and reach the top at both Borobudur and Ur, but you cannot at Sanchi. So the way the stupa architecture was used in terms of the pilgrim or religious person was unique and different in Java compared to India. All of these examples I mentioned, however, had this one thing in common. They were solid mounds, not meant to be penetrated and having no significant interior spaces. This is like the pyramids in Egypt and in Mesoamerica as well. So let's analyze this. You can see that the very base of the stupa is a broad, flat terrace that follows the complex, indented shape of the narrow terraces above it, of which there are five. This wide base was suited to the circumambulation of pilgrims, just like the circular passage with the railing at Sanchi, except, of course, these terraces here are square and not round. You can see that there are four central staircases that cut through the center of each side, and they pass through elaborate corbelled gateways that have monstrous kala heads created as apotropaic devices. In other words, guardians that are meant to ward off evil. The meaning of Borbadur is reflected by its plan. The ten levels represent the ten stages of the bodhisattva, or the Buddhist path to nirvana. If you follow this path, you too can learn how to reach 
nirvana. To break it down further, let's look at the levels. The whole square base of six terraces is considered to be the sphere of desire, kamadatu, or the most earthly of the three spheres of Borbudur. The second sphere is on the middle level, and it's considered to be the sphere of form, rupadatu, while the top is the sphere of formlessness, arupadatu. So as you climb the levels, you, as a pilgrim, are moving from the basest and most earthly themes to the most exalted ones, leading ultimately to the heavens, or nirvana, which is exemplified by the crowning stupa at the top. This crowning stupa is solid and has no image at all. Relief carvings adorn the lowest levels of Borobudur, the square ones, and they show scenes from the life of the Buddha and his disciples, and from the Jatakas, or teaching fables. They are sculpted on the walls of the stupa, an interior of the balustrade, which forms a very high stone railing. So you're enclosed and hemmed in as you circle, and you're surrounded by figures in relief. But when you arrive at the top with the three circular terraces, all representational reliefs stop. You find yourself in the open air again, on top of the mountain, with a clear and distant view of the beautiful valley and mountain range beyond. Your breath might be taken away for a moment as you savor this release from the earthly realm below and take in your new perspective. On these three highest circular levels, you only see figures of the Buddha in bell-shaped, perforated stone forms. You are released from the sense of claustrophobia that you might have felt below. Now you might feel a certain lightness with the view. The Buddhas within each of these bells are seated, and each of them makes a gesture with a particular meaning. The Buddha images are serene, still, softly modeled, and naturalistic. They're removed from the hubbub of ordinary existence. However, most are difficult to see as they're enclosed by these bell shapes. Some of the bells have been damaged, and the Buddha within them has been released for our eyes to see. Two million feet of andesite stone were used to build Barbador. All of it had to be hewn out of the neighboring mountains, transported to the site and carved with 1,460 pictorial and 1,212 decorative panels. 504 sculptures of Buddha were made, and 72 of them were placed in these hollow, trellised, bell-shaped forms on the circular terraces at the top of the monument. The effect is truly astounding. As you approach the monument closely, the impression is really one of pandemonium in stone. There are corners, arches, sculptures of Buddha in niches, and the view to the top is not at all clear. You're struck by the numerous gargoyles, sea monsters, contrasted with these serene Buddhas in lotus position in each niche. Remember, there are more than 500 of these figures. But let's go back to the cycle of reliefs and pretend we are walking up Borbadur from the bottom, circumambulating in a clockwise direction, keeping our right side to the mountain. As we walk, we are looking at and learning lessons from the sculpted narrative reliefs of this enormous symbol of Buddhist cosmology. If we start at the very bottom of the monument, there's a hidden foot which has outer walls carved with scenes of earthly existence. These include scenes of people doing good and evil and getting the rewards or the punishment that they deserve. Even hell is depicted. This foot was covered up by stones and was subsequently rediscovered. The plinth may have been widened and covered these due to some unexpected problems with the weight of the structure or it might have been covered because of a change in ideology. 
As you continue upwards, you are in the area with more visible and lengthy narrative reliefs. A cycle of scenes tells the story of a prince who became a bodhisattva and scenes from the Jataka, or stories with morals. There are scenes from the life of Buddha when he was Prince Siddhartha, and more showing the seekers of higher wisdom of the Buddha. These carvings can be compared with the much smaller carvings at Sanchi on the cross beams of the Toranas. They have similar narrative content and similar intent to instruct. The sculptural images of Buddha reside in the niches on the inner side of the monument. The niches' arches are topped with a pointed element. Each niche is crowned by a spire, which adds to the feeling of upward lift of the stupa. Let's take a look at some of the reliefs in the cycle of stories. These, in general, are carved in a naturalistic high relief and are incredibly detailed. The artists put as much effort into the small things as they did the most prominent. They're perhaps the most elegant and beautiful reliefs of any Buddhist temple. In some respects, you could say that they don't form a cycle of coherent chronological narrative as we would envision it in the West. Rather, they are a complex series of different stories and illustrate lessons for pilgrims. The life of Buddha is gorgeously illustrated, but only to his first sermon at Benares, after which it stops inexplicably. And as his life is illustrated in panels on an upper register, his past lives are illustrated on the lower register. The cycle of rebirths, of course, makes following Buddha's path a bit of a challenge for the non-Buddhist. Here, for instance, is the descent of the Bodhisattva to earth where he sits on the lion throne and is borne down from heaven by the pressing mass of a hundred and ten dozen gods. They're not kneeling, the gods, but they're floating in the clouds. Royal umbrellas and fans round out the relief. The pyramidal structure helps you focus on the main figure, and the tangled mass of beings contrasts with the peaceful isolation of the bodhisattva. Here is another scene which you may remember from Sanji, the dream of Maya, the mother of the Buddha, who dreams of his birth when the white elephant with six tusks comes to her. Servant girls surround her. In another scene, Queen Maya goes on her journey home to give birth to her son, Prince Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. She's illustrated as she rests in her horse-drawn wagon on the way to Lumbini. She was supposed to have had a huge and colorful entourage. You can see how complex the scene is, overlapping humans, horses, and umbrellas, all within a treed landscape. Gives some sense of the detail of these carvings, and even recall the overlapping and perspective of Trajan's column. One later vignette from Buddha's life is this, which shows the miracles which occur before his birth. Buddha's father, King Suddhodana, is in his palace. The king was said to have experienced 500 young white elephants touching his legs with their trunks as a sign of Buddha's impending birth. You can see one of them doing that here, while the other small elephants form an engaging and pleasing whirligig design with their trunks. A later scene from the Buddha's life shows him shaving his head in order to assume the life of an ascetic. His servants hold his worldly goods, which he has shed. Prince Siddhartha had left his palace on the back of his faithful horse, Kantaka. Note how the horse dominates the right side. Kantaka was to die of a broken heart when his master departed. He was said to have been reborn as a Brahmin. Another cycle of exquisitely carved reliefs shows scenes from the mythic story of Sudana and Manohara, a couple 
which the man is a prince, and the woman, Manohara, is a half-bird and half-human mythical being. Some of the most complex and beautiful vignettes are these. Here, Manohara and Sudana sit on a raised, canopied couch. They're relaxing while they watch dancers and musicians perform. This is remarkable. You can make out the musicians at left. One of them has his back turned to us and is rendered in perfect perspective. Some of them play flutes, others bang cymbals or drums, while a girl dances. To the right are servants bearing the parasols and fans, and accompanied by two very docile-looking ponies and a skillfully rendered bejeweled elephant, who seems to dance to the music too. Look at the bend in his ankle. Now this gives us a lot of information about music and dance in 8th to 9th century Java. Other vignettes that give us a glimpse into this time period in Java are these. Here, a group of students is sitting in class, some leaning forward to hear what the teacher is saying. They hold lontar, which are the books made of palm leaves, which are characteristic of ancient Java. They took this unusual form. In fact, one whole department of the Jakarta Museum, when I was there, was devoted to these ancient sacred palm manuscripts. Now, there's a bit of a telling detail that can also be seen here. The doves that are perching on the roof indicate that the students are very quiet. More images depict outrigger sailing ships of the age, elaborate architecture of the palaces, trees, fruits and flowers, and many animals such as birds, elephants, horses, and palanquins and vehicles. Finally, the relief you see here shows a stupa. You can see the dome ornamented with garland swags and with the parasol device at the top. You can also see all the offerings the worshippers are making at the foot of the stupa, fruit, incense, and other foods. The shape of the stupa reflects the very topmost element of Borobudur. The relief you see here shows the lotus blossom, a reminder to us of the symbolic meaning of the Borobudur stupa as a cosmic lotus floating on a worldly sea. So, what can we learn from Borobudur? What are the big lessons that help us understand this amazing and enormous monumental artwork? How does it compare to ancient monumental architecture that we've already looked at and some examples we are about to look at? Let me define the overarching message of Borbudur. It leads us on a path to enlightenment if we are the pilgrims. On the lowest level, the law of karma is carved. It shows us in a very clear and a visual way what the right path in life must be. We are reading a narrative, a narrative of lessons carved in relief that must be inculcated. They essentially perform this function of social control and indoctrination into group values. The fables and the stories that you see teach you to distinguish what is right from what is wrong. They provide these concrete examples of self-control and moderation, and they teach you how to regard life without painful anxiety or suffering, just as the Buddha did. You're enclosed in a narrow space while doing this. Then, when you reach the open terrace, you feel release. You see the Buddha statues, each enclosed in its bell-shaped stupa. The Buddhas in the niches below and here at the zenith inform, instruct, and guide with their nuanced hand gestures. These gestures include signs for benevolence, courage, reason, virtue, concentration, all the good traits one ought to have. The 72 Buddhas on the very top make a gesture that indicates the turning of the wheel of Dharma, or Buddhist law. You should be getting the message at this point. For a Badur guides you up and into the light, and your body 
takes this actual pilgrimage path from ground level to the celestial realm. You, your body, experiences changes in view and in space that could give you or should give you a transformational feeling. At the very top, the sky opens up and you see the simplicity and the beauty of the message. So the religious experience of circumambulating, reading the stories, and learning from the Buddhas, and reaching the summit was a striking form of meditation on your life and on the values you hold. You have the chance in this process to reflect on your own conduct and on the bigger issues of existence. Your body experiences the sensations of change and reflections too as you climb. In creating Borbudur, the 8th century Javanese who built it with this enormous outpouring of labor and love, they must have experienced something similar to the pilgrims who came later. Their community was pulled together to focus on their religious and cultural message, which they expressed in stone. Their artworks had to express the sublime. It must have been extremely uplifting and community building. Barbadour wasn't just meant for a religious pilgrimage. It was a geographical center and an expression of divine cosmology. The idea of the sacred mountain that lies at the center of the universe has many cultural adherents. This mountain of Borbudur represents a cosmological diagram. It engages the cardinal points. The axis mundi, which marks its center, is exactly where the central blank stupa on top stands. It crystallizes the idea of three levels of the cosmos, the underworld, which is the plinth, the earthly realm, which is the square terraces, and the celestial realm, the top with its round terraces. So this monument expresses quite a few big ideas about cosmic space and religious thought. It has several functions for the people who lived here and for those who made the pilgrimage here. Borbidur is like Sanchi in that it is essentially a Buddhist monument, and it uses the more or less domed shape that we saw is customary in India. Both are solid and not penetrable. But it's also very different from the Indian Buddhist expression. It has the stepped terraces, all decorated with elaborate stories, and it allows the pilgrims to actually walk to the top in order to reach nirvana. It's far more intricately decorated than Sanchi and its ilk. The profusion of sculptures, reliefs, Buddha statues, and walkways is unlike anything else in India or the world, but it still shares the basic idea of the cosmic mountain. Curiously, this cosmic mountain becomes even more important in our next set of lectures when we look at the masterpieces of the ancient Americas. In Mesoamerica, which is present-day Mexico and Central America, the idea of a sacred mountain with a cave and a spring within it lies at the very center of their cosmology. We'll see a whole series of sacred mountains built in each culture to express the cosmic levels of lower, the underworld, middle, the earth, and upper, the celestial realm. The mountains are actually worshipped and referred to in much, if not most, of the art. We're going to start by looking at the place where the first complex civilization in the Americas arose, the Olmec. That was in the swampy jungles near fertile volcanic mountains on the Gulf of Mexico in the states of Tabasco and Veracruz. It's here in Olmec territory that we find the same interest in reaching the divine through building monumental architecture, mountains of soil and stone. The mountains built by the native people of Mesoamerica were, like Borbadur, places of pilgrimage and sacred places that receive offerings. 
We are now going to fly over the oceans, halfway across the world, in order to see this new culture with its extraordinary manifestation of sacred architecture and monumental stone carvings.